Hey everyone, welcome to the online weekend experience. I'm so glad you're joining us. I encourage you wherever you're at to join in with us as we sing about Jesus. That's what we're going to be doing is just declaring all that he has done. So I encourage you just to contemplate on the words, maybe sing along, maybe have a little dance party, whatever it is, I encourage you to do it. So here we go. Let's do this. How's it going, everyone? My name is Dan, and I lead student ministries here at Medina East. I just want to welcome you to our uh, online weekend experience. Hope that you feel loved and connected because we truly love you and, and want to, uh, to stay connected and right there uh, with you in your lives, wherever you're at. 
And so we know there's a lot of things always changing, a lot of things going on. And so what we'd like to do right out of the gate is just recommend that you check out our website if you have any questions or any uh, things you'd like to contribute or, or figure out. And you can check out our website at medinaeast.gracechurches.org. Again, that's a fantastic way to find out every kind of all the information and things that are happening here at Medina East. Now, one of the big things that's happening or that actually just happened this past weekend was our high school summer retreat. Me, my wife, and our team had the incredible privilege of hanging out with 22 high school students uh, this past weekend out uh, at a property near our church. And we actually got to see six uh, students make the decision to get baptized and to go public in their faith. The baptism is a way of symbolizing that, that I am handing my life over to Jesus. I'm identifying with him and I'm walking with him in obedience. And so we have six students over here that have made a decision to get baptized today. And I would like to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Father. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. And of the Son. <laughs> it is a slippery one. <laughs> Son and of the Holy Spirit, Father, and of the Son. It was an incredible time of worship and of learning about Jesus. Uh, a lot of kids made really sweet decisions to, to kind of take the next step in their faith and pursue Jesus uh, in a variety of different ways. So we just want to highlight and celebrate that and say thank you, Jesus, for uh, uh, providing and, and moving in powerful ways this weekend. We'd also like to highlight uh, our, our programming for, for students. So if you're in high school or somebody you know is in high school, we have what's called Ignite. And Ignite meets uh, at 7 p.m. on Wednesday nights out in the, in the tent in the back uh, of, of our property. Uh, we hang out, talk about Jesus, play games, eat snacks, and it's just a really cool way to get connected. So I just would love to recommend that to you if you or someone you know is in high school. And for our middle school students, we have what's called EPIC. And we meet uh, on six, uh, at 6 p.m. On, on Saturday nights and 11.15 uh, on Sunday, on Sunday uh, mornings uh, during the normal service times. So if you or someone you know is in middle school, we'd love to get you connected that way. Uh, again, we hang out, we talk about Jesus, we have a lot of fun. It's really cool. So we'd love to see you at that. And again, we just want to say we, uh, we love you and we're glad that you're getting connected uh, to our online weekend experience. And we hope you guys have a, a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for getting connected. Love you guys. Well, hey, Grace Church, Medina East Campus. I am Steve, and I get to help out with uh, things like give it away at our campus, which is sharing the message and story of Jesus to our community and to our world. And you're probably viewing this online in some way. And so thank you. Thanks for checking out um, our online weekend service. We're, we're glad to just be able to have the technology and to, to do this and to um, bring this sermon to you uh, through this way. So thank you. Thank you for joining. And today um, we've been, we're going to continue in a series and a conversation that we've been talking about called Review. And so if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, you know that we have been in the series. If not, if you're just jumping in, um, I would encourage you to check out the last uh, few weeks that we've um, started this series. Basically, though, this series is 
um, in Revelation, and specifically the first few uh, chapters of Revelation where uh, we see this really interesting vantage point of Jesus talking to his churches, to his churches in that time. And so we've been asking ourselves some questions as we're going through this. Uh, questions like, um, what is Jesus' vision for his church? Um, you know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opinions and things that we, uh, myself including, can have on what the church is and how it should function and everything. But what's cool is that there are letters to churches from Jesus. And so we get to see those things. So what is his vision, vision for his church? And then how do we pursue that vision together uh, with our church? And so those are the questions that we're asking in this series, basically. So what I want to do for today, for this weekend, is I kind of I just want to explore a place called Izmir, okay? I want to take you to a place called Izmir. It's a place that you could fly to right now. Actually, um, literally right now, it's in Turkey. I think they recently opened the borders because of COVID stuff. So you could literally fly there uh, right now and go there. And so this is a picture of Izmir in Turkey. You can see it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a place right on the water there. And so just give you a couple stats here of Izmir. It's uh, the third largest city in Turkey. Um, it has a population of over 4 million people. As you can see, it's a beautiful port city. Um, some more statistics by um, a, 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 an organization called Open Doors. They um, do a lot with like the persecuted church, they would call it. And so here's some stats that they have. They suggest that there are 24,000, what they would say, 24,000 Protestant Christians or Bible-believing um, Christians that share their faith on a daily basis. 24,000 living in Turkey um, out of 4 million. And just to give you perspective, um, there is a church in Atlanta, Georgia, one of the biggest churches in the world, um, that uh, at least pre-COVID, um, they would have 30,000 people a week come through their doors. And so compared to 24,000 Christians living in this place in Turkey. And so um, with that, maybe just a few hundred of those Christians are actually living in Izmir. Uh, another thing that Open Doors reports is that uh, Turkey is facing a lot of uh, pressure, uh, a lot of persecution, a little bit in the area of violence, but a lot in family pressures or government pressures um, as the, the country is becoming more um, Islamic. And so um, you see that a lot of Christians right now, even in this day and time in Turkey, are facing a lot of pressure for being a follower of Jesus, um, pressure from their family, um, pressure from their government and things like that. And so you could probably tell, okay, yeah, I'm the give it away guy. Um, of course, I'm going to talk about some of these things and talk about missions and stuff like that. You can tell that I uh, really appreciate culture and the gospel and all that. But I, I was looking through and saying, man, what, I, want to, I want to actually talk to these churches. I want to see what these churches are actually going on and what's going on in these churches and what they're doing. Because, you know, it's one thing to look at stats and look at open doors and say, oh, okay, this is like the general uh, thing going on. It's another thing to actually talk to the church. So I did. I was looking along online and I found one of the churches that uh, still meets in Izmir. And it was actually in English. So I was like, cool, I can read this. And I, they had a, a contact section. So I was like, well, what could it hurt? And so I contacted this church uh, in Izmir and I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to be doing a sermon uh, this weekend. Um, could you tell me a little bit about your church and how we could be praying for you? And they actually got back to me. And so I just want to read this email reply um, in this church in Izmir. And it goes like this. Uh, he says, hey, my name is Helmut Frank. I believe he's a, a German uh, missionary out here, out there in Izmir. So I'm Helmut Frank, and I am one of the founders of the Lighthouse Churches in Izmir. We started the main church in Alsenkak, and sorry for my pronunciation here, uh, 26 years ago, and planted the church in Karasiyaka about six years ago. Last year, three of our foreign pastors, including me, got an entrance ban for Turkey. So our Turkish brothers had to step up and take responsibility for the churches. So please pray especially for them, their wives, and the leadership team. Pray for workers for the harvest, also for maturing of the new believers. More people are open for the gospel in recent times. And he goes on some of these stats that I just said. He said, Izmir has a population of 4 million. In the whole city, there are maybe 500 or 600 Turkish evangelical believers. So please pray for Izmir, Izmir and Turkey. Thank you for your interest. So I just thought that was fantastic. There's um, this place that you could actually go and see. It's called Izmir, Turkey. And 
where I'm like, well, let's just talk to them and see what they might have us pray for. So I thought it'd be good if we just pray for this church right now. So would you join me as I just pray for this church, um, the Lighthouse churches and some of the things that they're praying, asking us to pray for. Well, Lord Jesus, we just uh, thank you that we have the technology, like I said, to uh, do online uh, services, but also just to send an email uh, across the world to uh, people, to your people, and to ask them, like, how can we pray for you for real? So, Lord, I do. I pray. Um, I just, I just invite our church to pray for this church and these um, sets of churches in Izmir. Lord, we pray for the leadership team there. We pray for um, the wives and leadership team there, Lord, that they would persevere and, and even though that there's a lot of pressure for being a follower of Jesus, uh, Lord, pray for those. Um, foreign missionaries that have those travel bans. Lord, I can't imagine just spending 26 years of your life trying to reach out to these, um, to this country and just to be banned for that. So I pray for them and their work. Lord, I pray for more workers, God, um, just like he asked us to pray, for more workers to um, have a heart for your people in Turkey and to share the gospel with those four million people. And so, God, would you send more people to Izmir, Turkey? Would you raise up those new believers in Turkey, Lord? Help them to understand your gospel fully and want to share that uh, to others in Turkey. And so, Lord, we just thank you um, that we can um, pray for our brothers and sisters in another place. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, thank you for praying uh, with us for uh, this, these churches in Izmir. So that's a little bit of information about uh, Izmir. And I wanted to start off this way because I really wanted that to be uh, a perspective for us as we continue through uh, Revelation, as we continue through to this letter. Because if you didn't pick it up already, um, Izmir is actually modern day Smyrna. It's modern day Smyrna. So Smyrna was a city um, that was founded by the Greeks. Um, in, the, in the biblical times, as we'll see. And at some point, um, the, it became Turkish, and they took the Turkish name of Smyrna, which is Izmir. So that's the connection here. So to get into what we're in today, we're going to talk about Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And what we'll see is that Jesus is talking to the church in Smyrna, which is what? It's modern day Izmir. So to give us a little bit of perspective, this is a real life place that we can go to even today. One of the places that um, out of the revelation, out of revelation here, that there's still churches in this area. So join me, if you will, in Revelation 2, verse 8 through 11, and we'll read this whole section, and then we'll get into breaking it down a little bit. So it goes in like this in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue, synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay, so the letter is to the church in Smyrna. Um, and it's not actually too much different from Izmir today. And so there are some similar similarities, but there are also some nuances. So for example, uh, Smyrna was uh, the largest city in, out of these seven churches. It wasn't um, the, the third largest city. Uh, and they were prideful about this. In fact, on their coin, it wrote this, first city of Asia in size and beauty. So they're proud of that. Uh, is the birthplace of Greek poets or writers like Homer, you may have heard of. Um, they, they say that they were first in a lot of the temples that were being built for gods and goddesses. It was even the home of a popular bishop named Polycarp, which I'll actually tell a story about in a little bit. Um, another interesting fact is that Smyrna was once destroyed in 580 BC, and they actually completely rebuilt it in 290 BC. So, of course, they were prideful of that, that they can be in destruction and come back to life again. So it's safe to say that they were proud of being first, proud of being able to come out of destruction and back to life in these things. So having heard that, some of that information is actually really interesting because of what Jesus says to the church in Smyrna. So let's go back to verse 8. 
He says to the church, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last and who died and came to life again. Okay, so Jesus, he's seemingly doing two things here. One, Jesus is relating directly to the city and to the people of Smyrna by saying, hey, your city and people, they think that they are the first and everything. I need to tell you that I am the first and I am the last. Uh, the scripture it often talks about how uh, Jesus, he is the alpha and the omega, like, we'll see, like we would see later on in Revelation, and how everything was made by him and for him, that he existed always and will always exist. And so he says, your city and people, um, that you need to know that I am the first and the last. And then he says, who died and came back to life again. Your city and people, you say you were destroyed once and you came back to life. You're prideful about that. I was put to death. <laughs> and here I am back to life again, even to this day. So Jesus, obviously, he's the great one-upper. <laughs> uh, number two here, Jesus is directly encouraging and comforting the believers, the followers of Jesus in the church of Smyrna, and really to his church uh, today. And by the way, out of the seven letters to the churches, only two of them have absolutely no critique at all. And this is the first one. And that's pretty sweet. We should figure out how to be like that church. <laughs> we should figure that out. So um, much like the other letters, Jesus starts out with uh, kind of a comfort of who Jesus is in the grand scheme of things. He, the God that you serve, Jesus, he is like this. He has the first say in things the last say in things, and not even death can stop him. And so his mission and him trying to reconcile people back to himself cannot be stopped. He wants to bring people back to relationship with their creator. Well, and speaking of this encouragement, um, as I said, Jesus keeps going on into encouraging us instead of critiquing us or this church. And admittedly though, it is an interesting kind of encouragement. One that is honestly really uh, close to how I personally enjoy encouragement, and uh, maybe you're like this, <laughs> but you know, it's the kind of encouragement where uh, you ask the question maybe like, will life get easier? Will my life get less busy? Uh, will there ever be a better way to uh, work on my marriage? Will, like, will things get better? Um, what about with my kids? Is this just a phase or are things gonna change? And so the honest, caring person, right, like myself or others that have talked to me in this way, they will tell you, uh, no, <laughs> actually, uh, life gets harder in a lot of ways. Uh, life doesn't get less busy. Um, by the way, we offer premarital uh, counseling and mentorship. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've heard people say, well, just wait till your kids get a little bit older and then come back and talk to me. <laughs> it's like that kind of encouragement, as we'll see here in verse 9 again. He says this, going back to here, he says, I know your afflictions. I know your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, so Jesus, he's saying here that Jesus knows some things about this church, about these people, and about what is going on. He knows it because he sees his churches. He actually sees them. And he knows it because he has actually also gone through these things. Jesus also knows it personally. Jesus has been through affliction, through poverty, through slander. He knows it quite well. He knows that those that would follow after him would experience the same exact things or very similar that he has experienced. And it's these things, especially when you're doing all the right things. They have no critique at all. They're doing the right things. So let's break it down. Let's talk about afflictions here. This says afflictions, this translation, you might have another translation that says uh, tribulation, for example. Think of it this way. Think of it as an intense pressure. It's the pressure that you get with a migraine, one that I know all too well. It's the pressure of being crushed under something very heavy. It's the pressure that comes when you don't expect it to be there. And so for our friends in Izmir, it's the pressure of spending 26 years living and giving your life to these people in a hard place where the gospel is not present just to be rejected and banned from the country. You know, other things I've read is that uh, Christians even now today are even losing property and status today because of the pressures of the government. So there was pressure for the church in Smyrna. There's pressure in Izmir today. 
And so I mentioned earlier that I was going to share a story about Polycarp, this bishop who had lived in this day. Well, something interesting about him, by the way, he was also someone who was a disciple of John. Okay, John, he's the guy who is super close to Jesus. Um, uh, He's often called the beloved disciple. And he was the one who wrote what we're reading. Okay, he wrote Revelation. (laughs) And yeah, he led this church Smyrna at some point. And so the story goes on like this. Basically, persecution had started to get stronger in Smyrna in this area, and Christians were being forced to renounce their faith in Jesus in favor for the Roman emperor. He is captured, Polycarp's captured, and finds himself in front of Caesar with the opportunity to renounce Jesus and bow before him in front of others. And he was urged to um, say this. (laughs) He was literally urged to say this phrase, from Caesar. He says, swear by the spirit of Caesar, repent and say away with the atheists. Okay, of course, this is uh, pretty hilarious because um, what you have to realize is that Christians were seen as atheists in this day. Um, they, They were seen as atheists because they worshiped a God that they couldn't see. There was no statue of this God. There was no temple for this God. Uh, This God didn't have any government position. Jesus didn't have a governmental uh, position. And so they must be atheists. And so in these days where worshiping one God is weird, whereas in, um, I'm sorry, in those days where worshiping one God is weird, in our day, worshiping any God is weird. Okay, so that's a little context for you. So anyways, Polycarp, For the first time, he accepts what he has been asked to do, and he gladly shouts, away with the atheist. (laughs) And so um, (laughs) it's just funny because he's just like, yeah, I'll say that, okay? And so obviously that got um, Caesar a little mad. So one of the other final phrases before his martyrdom, when when being pressed to further deny Jesus, he says this. He says, Polycarp says, 86 years I have been his servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? And of course he gets martyred. And there's a lot more you can say about Polycarp and his story. And I would encourage you to to read up on it at some point. But what we need to realize is that Jesus is saying to this church, he says, I know your affliction. I know the pressures that you are experiencing. And he doesn't say that they'll go away. He says, I know them. Okay, and then what about poverty and this whole thing here? Poverty and slander. Well, the Roman Empire, they became a superpower and what they said goes. So up to this point, they let the Jewish people kind of off the hook on some of those things. Um, they had this kind of deal or arrangement going on. They didn't have to participate in the many ways of worship um, to Caesar and to the emperor. However, now you have these people called the Christians, okay, disobeying the worship of Caesar and these things. And, you know, having just came, a lot of them just coming from being Jews, uh, being of the Jewish um, uh, religion. So it made the empire mad. And it also made the Jewish people scared and mad. So the Jews, they slandered, um, they, they slandered the Christians. They fought to be completely distinct so that their rights wouldn't be taken away. And this is why Jesus says they are slandering me and my people and are therefore not a synagogue of the Lord, but of Satan. And so Christians were in a rough spot. Smyrna was a very wealthy place, but the government and the Jews being in the conflict with the Christians would not do business with them. Their businesses were shut down. They received no support. They became poor and unable to work or live freely as followers of Jesus. And so Jesus says, I know your poverty. I know the slander. I know the poverty because I was poor. I had no home to place my head or a place to rest my head. And now Jesus does throw in a little further encouragement, that encouragement that we were talking about. He says, but you are rich. Meaning, just like Jesus being poor to earthly standards, they were rich in the thing that mattered actually the most. They were rich spiritually. They had a right relationship with Jesus. They have a room waiting for them in heaven, the new heaven and new earth. They have eternal life and everything that they need. They are rich. And Jesus says, I know your slander. I've been there. My people slandered me and also, my people slandered me also. And so, of course, they are going to slander you as well. And I'm sure Jesus was saddened to say that his people were overrun by the influences of Satan and driven by fear of losing their political stance by the protection of the Roman Empire. 
They seemed less concerned with um, the security of being in the kingdom of God and uh, more concerned about the fleeting securities of the Roman Empire. And here comes more of that encouragement that we were talking about. Let's go to verse 10 here. He says, do not be afraid. Let's point out some things here. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Now notice that Jesus doesn't say, don't be afraid, I'm going to take it all away for you, and things are going to go back to normal. Life is going to go back to normal the way that it was before. He says, don't be afraid, you're about to suffer. And the devil will imprison many of you and test you. And you will suffer more of these things. And whether it's 10 real days or not, I don't think it matters. He's saying it's going to be a short time, but these things are going to happen. So for us, we might think, whoa, whoa, whoa. (laughs) So you mean to tell me that if I'm a follower of Jesus and doing seemingly all the right things, there's no critique here. I will likely be led down the same path that Jesus went on, that I will likely have to suffer, be tested, experience persecution of all types. Somehow the devil could be involved in all of this, and at some point, death could be the result. Yeah, that's sort of what he's saying here. That's sort of what could happen. So go ahead, jump on our website if you're not there already, and fill out our Connect card. Let us know that you want to follow Jesus today. (laughs) This is that interesting encouragement that Jesus gives to those that would follow Jesus. See, the thing is, there is a spiritual side here. The Christians aren't just arguing or in argument with a dictating political power out to get them and take away their business and things like that, or a religious group that cares more about their worldly political status than the the status that they could have with the kingdom of God. The devil, the adversary, the Satan, the one who wants Jesus and his followers dead, is very much at work. Now, Jesus has already defeated the powers of this world, namely the devil, the Satan. And so he can't really do much to Jesus except for come after his followers. But Jesus says with comfort, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be faithful. The worst thing that can happen to you in this life is that you die. I am the first and the last. Jesus has authority over everything, and he will give you life, the victor's crown. And it's a crown of your faithfulness, one that will never wither away, but will be yours forever, a symbol of a relationship that you have with the creator God who has a place for you. So Jesus closes in verse 11, and he says this again. Whoever has ears... Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Well, to explain this point of not being hurt by the second death, um, I'm going to quote this book. I think Tony has mentioned it before in weeks past. Uh, It's called Discipleship on Edge. If it's not in your Amazon cart, then put it there. It's a great book if you want to read more about Revelation and these things. But and actually, this is a, this is a, let's see, I quoted a book that quoted a person. So um, the person is E.V. Hill, and he says this, Those who are born once die twice. Those who are born twice die once. And, and that's just stuck with me. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen to the persecuted church doing everything right in Smyrna? They die once. See, for followers of Jesus who are born twice or born again, as the the church world says it, or as Jesus states it, you are born into a life full of relationship to Jesus. Though your body might die, which by the way, all of us will die at some point, you will go on to live forever with Jesus. And for those that do not follow after Jesus, he's not going to force you to spend eternity with him. And that is the second death, the death of being uh, detached and separated from right relationship with your creator forever. So he says, whoever has ears, let them hear what he says, what the spirit says to the churches. And so what can we hear to the church in Medina, to our church? See, the spirit is real 
and is very much alive and active today. And I believe that the Spirit of God isn't just giving a word uh, to the church in Smyrna back then or to the church in Izmir today, but also to our church here in Medina, Ohio. And so I want to finish by making some connections here. Hopefully you've, you've made some connections on your own already, but let me give you a couple here. The first thing that kind of is hitting me with this is the, this phrase of like living godly lives. So one thing that I can't get away from when reading this letter is something that Paul, um, the Apostle Paul, tells Timothy, this guy that he was discipling. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 12, he says this, All who desire to live godly lives will be persecuted. (laughs) You live godly life, you will be persecuted. And so there is some chatter in the Christian world and elsewhere that if you do good things, you will be blessed And what they really mean to say is that if you keep doing good, you'll receive peace, comfort, security, political and social favor, money, wealth, and the list goes on. And that's just simply not always true. I think the confusing part here, though, is we get confused on what living a godly life actually means in our own context. See, sometimes Christians can get persecuted candidly, for doing not godly things, for doing self-promoting agenda kind of things. Things like, and honestly, (laughs) I want to be um, right here with an audience in front of the camera and uh, with a platform and kind of just provide a list of things that I see actual followers of Jesus shouting about and doing that I would never do or shout about and things that aren't my personal opinion but they're shouting about it on a platform, maybe on social media, whatever. And then I realize that I would be on a platform shouting about people that are shouting about people that aren't doing things that I like. And so I'm not gonna do that. (laughs) But I think we need to pause and pray about this and consider what does living a godly life look like in my life? We need to figure out what living a godly life looks like. And not what Steve thinks a godly life should look like, but what the Spirit and the Word is telling our churches about what a godly life looks like. See, we may not have pressures um, like in modern day Izmir or in other places in the world that actually can't meet as a church. And it's not because of COVID. It's because of pressure and it's illegal and persecution. The question that we should ask is what will we do with those pressures, the pressures that we have now, though, no matter how big or small, will you live a godly life through them? Would Jesus give you encouragement or critique? Would he give our church encouragement or critique? Would he say the same thing to us? What are we going to do about it? So to finish here, I actually, I just can't get away from uh, this book again, Discipleship on the Edge. It was such a, uh, an eye-opener to me. And so I'm going to read off the last few, the last couple paragraphs of uh, the place in the book where it's talking about this church. And I think it really hones in on this point for us. So I would just encourage you as we read this, it's going to be a little lengthy, just a little bit, but let's ponder these things. Even if you have to stop and pause and pray with yourself or with your family, let's ponder these things. So it says this, did the disciples in Smyrna overcome fear and keep the faith? Yes. We know this because of the seven church, because of the seven churches Jesus addressed, only the church of Smyrna still exists. As I said earlier, Smyrna is now called Izmir. Izmir is a vibrant center of Eastern Orthodox worship and education. Seldom during the last 19th centuries has the pressure lifted for the disciples there, and seldom has its vitality waned. Will the churches of our time stand when the pressure increases? Will you, will I, stand as the test gets tougher? The only clue we have is how we are doing in the lesser tests that come our way now. I know your pressure, says the Lord. It seems only fair to conclude by telling you that there is a way out of the pressure. Just don't get serious about loving Jesus. Just go with the flow of the culture. Just settle for a comfortable, run-of-the-mill, watered-down kind of discipleship, Christianity light. Just settle for a status quo blessing kind of discipleship and there will be no pressure and there will be no passion. I know your pressure, says the one who loves us. 
In the nature of things, he cannot lift it. Sustain us in it, yes. Use it for his glory, yes. But lift it, no. For his presence is the reason the pressure comes. When I remember that, I can keep going and even do so with a strange sort of joy. Would you pray with us? Jesus, I uh, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you are the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. Lord, that you had died and you raised again. And you are alive even now today, Lord, and you are speaking to your churches. You spoke to your church in Smyrna. You speak to your church in Izmir today and you comfort them with the pressures that they have. And Lord, you speak to the church in Medina, to our church here and the pressures that we have. Though they may be different than other pressures in the world, Lord, we have pressure. And so, Lord, thank you that you comfort us in those things. You tell us, Lord, to be faithful. It's just a short while that this pressure is here, whatever that pressure might be. And that one day when you come back, we will have the victor's crown, <laughs> the thing that will last forever, relationship with you, our creator. God, would you just help me? Would you help us, our church, understand what being in pressure looks like, what being faithful even under pressure looks like to live a godly life, Lord? I want to be that church that has no critique. But Lord, we're messed up. <laughs> we are. We're people. We're humans. And it's hard. Lord, help us. Lord, show us your way, because your way is good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.